Right, joining me now is Jacko Jackcheck, the uh, now vocalist and guitarist for, of course, King Crimson. Um, you're embarking on 51 shows to celebrate the 50th anniversary of yeah. the band. Um, first things first, how are you? You okay? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm I'm limping slightly because I played football last night, but that's uh, <laughs> that's my fault for being so delusional as to think I can do that at my age. But you involved in a hard tackle or something? Or no, it's no, just it, the, the only battle is with my body, really, <laughs> rather than anybody else's. So, of course, this tour celebrating the uh, the anniversary of the band. Yeah. Um, you're kicking off in Leipzig, starting rehearsals in yeah. Leipzig. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And then, of course, a few dates at the Albert Hall uh, towards the end, mid to mid to late June. Yeah. Um, what are you? I mean, in terms of the Albert Hall dates, uh, are you excited to come back to the UK to do some? To do some well, it's there? such a lovely, iconic venue, and um, what I love about the Albert Hall, I mean, you know, along with its history and 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 the iconic nature of its status, is when you play it, and I've played it before, I played it uh, when I was lead guitarist in level 42. Um, although the capacity is somewhere in the region of 5,000 plus, because it's in the round, it feels very intimate, you know, as opposed to 5,000 people in a, in a kind of long straight hall. So that's lovely. And you can see the faces of people. Uh, and plus, uh, they've just, they've redesigned the sound system in there. Um, so uh, they've got a brand new kind of sound uh, system which was partly designed by a guy who's a big Crimson fan who consulted our sound man while they were doing it so, <laughs> so there's several reasons for it to be a, a, you know, a, a, a thing we're looking forward to In terms of your name, we mentioned this right at the start yeah. I'm trying to go back to this before we uh, kind of get involved with uh, King, King Crimson Yeah, well um, you can't even pronounce that, let alone <laughs> my surname <laughs> So with that name, I mean, you, that wasn't how you, that wasn't your birth name, of course. No, my birth name is Curran. Curran, yeah. I'm an Irish, I'm from Irish stock, but I was adopted by a Polish emigre and his French wife. And um, my father's documents when he came to England were inaccurately spelt. And um, he couldn't speak English sufficiently, he felt, to go through the complicated process of, of uh, informing people of that and changing it. And he felt it would just be easier to spell it incorrectly uh, which is what, what we've done and uh, now we are the only people with that spelling in the world if you type it into Google <laughs> you'll just get me so it's an admin error yeah administrative error yeah. <laughs> I want to talk now about level 42 oh because yeah your, your time there you were, was it about five years you were in something that, like that yeah, yeah. Um, in, I mean what was touring like with them firstly because you've done obviously a few tours with uh, King Crimson now is it, uh, do you notice any difference in terms of the, the audience and in terms of the reception you get or because obviously kind of slightly different styles yeah you know level 42 have an element of a kind of party band about them so I guess there's a slightly less kind of reverential uh, treatment because just because of the nature of the music but the actual uh, the actual pragmatics of, of touring and getting from A to B it's all pretty similar mm. um, we do a lot less uh, tour busing in, in Crimson you know um, we, we track we you know we uh, Ro Robert uh, Robert is, is 73 this year as indeed is Tony Levin um, and so one of his rules is listen if we're going to do this let's do this comfortably so we stay in very nice hotels we fly business class you know so um, yeah, it, it's it's a bit more upmarket, I guess. <laughs> Aside from the upmarket elements, do you do you enjoy touring? Do you? I mean, is that I love it. Yeah, I, I really love it, and I I miss it when you know. For years, I didn't do it, um, partly because I had young children, you know. But um, they're a lot older now, so uh, so yeah, it's, it's been great to get back out there and, and, and playing these amazing. You know, and some of the venues we have played and are playing are really extraordinary. Um, we did two nights last year at the ancient amphitheatre in Pompeii. I saw that on your Twitter, yeah, the yeah. picture there. It looked absolutely incredible. It was amazing. And, you know, the hairs on your arms stand on it. Uh, you know, walking down that stone tunnel that's thousands of years old, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we're playing some amazing places this year. We're doing the, uh, there's an amphitheatre in Verona, which looks like the Colosseum. Beautiful. Oh, wow. And that's about 9,000 uh, capacity. And we're playing Rockin' in Rio, which is 150,000 people on the beach in Brazil. Um, we're God, doing, that's be a good night. Uh, yeah, and the, in fact, you know, it was originally it was 50 shows for 50 years, but the very last show is at a, a place called the Movie Star Arena in Santiago in Chile, which I think holds about 15,000 people. It's sold out in two hours. Mm. So we got an email the following day saying, "Look, I know we're meant to be going home, but are you prepared to do another night? Because the promoter would like us to do one." Which is why we're playing 51, 51 shows. Here. To, 
that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so is it is it quite interesting then? So obviously you're doing venues like the Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. Then you're going to Rockin in Rio. You're yeah. Amphitheatres. So it's completely different venues. Well, I there's suppose, loads. So. Yeah, and we're doing festivals too. Yeah. And and they're and they're not they're not kind of ghettoized festivals in that you know we for instance we're playing a festival called the Doctor Music Festival in Spain. Uh, which is um, three nights. It's like Reading with lovely weather. <laughs> and uh, some of the acts are very modern, contemporary. I think Tom Walker, who's just one of oh, Brit, yeah. is doing it. Christine and the Queens, yeah. um, along with the likes of... Who else is doing that? Um, the Smashing Pumpkins, Primal Scream. So it's the idea is to put the band in front of a... A kind of wider audience rather than you know the, the kind of niche that one would expect and um, it's a three-day festival and we're playing every day and I think we're the only band doing that. In terms of your involvement with King Crimson yeah. I know you were kind of you were doing back in 2002 you were doing kind of an, almost like an alumnus type. Yeah type yeah everybody uh, yes yeah, so I, I, I ended That's up. That's it describes. Yeah yeah I was uh, I, I ended up in a band called the Schizoid Band where yeah Everybody in the band, apart from me, ironically enough, as it turns out, had been in King Crimson. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, you know, that was because of my love of, of Crimson and where, where I came from. I, you know, my next door neighbour played me Schizoid Man when I was 11 and it mm. completely freaked me out. And, uh, and they became my favourite group and one of the reasons I wanted to become a musician. So yeah, to find myself actually in that band all those years later was like some mad childhood dream made flesh, really. You mentioned them playing alongside, of course, Robert Fripp. I mean, yeah. that must be... Well, yeah, it's... It's quite odd in a way. It's odd, it's occasionally daunting, um, <laughs> not least of which because in the 80s, Robert changed the way he tuned his guitar. And he now uses a thing called new standard tuning, which is in fifths and his low string goes down to C. Um, but what that means on a, on a practical um, level is that some of the older material, because we're playing material from right across the catalogue, which the, which the band hasn't done for, for decades, um, it means that some of the parts, the notoriously difficult parts that Robert has written, um, he can't really play uh, because, I mean, purely from um, uh, an ergonomic point of view, because of the way that the tuning is. Yeah. Um, and I remember before we, we even did a first rehearsal, we were sat in my studio, him and me, discussing what tunes we might do. And I remember him saying, uh, what, what, I thought we should do Lark's Sons in Aspect Part 1. And I thought, oh, Brit, you know, as a fanboy, I thought, oh, fantastic. <laughs> he said, um, these parts, which are these notoriously difficult cross-picked parts in a different time signature to the rest of the band, he said, that's quite hard to play in this tuning, but you're playing in standard tuning, so you can play them. What? <laughs> So, yes, so, uh, you know, A, it's daunting enough to have to try and play those things. B, even worse, that the guy that wrote them yeah. is standing right next to you. Yeah. You have to get over that, otherwise you'd end up not playing anything like that. Did you find it hard at the start to get over that? Because obviously you've been a musician for years and yeah, years. Yeah, it was, it was weird. I, it was surreal. And, of course, you know, I've got, I've got, Rob, I've got these two iconic players yeah. either side of me. <laughs> so I've got, I've got Tony Levin to my right and Robert to my left. And yeah, I was, it was daunting. And at the end of one rehearsal, Robert took me to one side. And he said, Jack, when you come in tomorrow, um, I pay a bit more attention to what, to what I and Tony are playing. And I said, oh, am I really that untogether? He said, no, 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 no. We're making infinitely more mistakes than you are. So <laughs> it was a very nice way of trying to make me kind of relax and just That's don't worry cool. about it yet. So going back to, so you said you first listened to King Crimson when you were 11 years old, yeah. which of course wasn't too, I mean that must have been about the time they formed, was it? Or yeah. Perhaps a year before. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that, I mean you've been a musician for so many years, but were you, was that the, the first way you got into music or? Well I, I, I was, um, as I say, I had a next door neighbour who was a few years older than me, so he was constantly playing me things from that era, you know. Yeah. And I like prog rock type. Well, it was it wasn't called a, a. It wasn't called that back then. And B. I'm not sure the stuff that we were listening to originally What's was that? what was what eventually became that. I guess it was some stuff that was coming out of the blues boom. You know, like Cream and and Jethro Tull and mm. um, there was an American band as well called Chicago. Who, although they became synonymous with a rather kind of syrupy uh, ballad uh, <laughs> reputation in the 80s, when they started, they were really kind of. They were, they, were, they were really experimental and interesting and um, 
so I'd, I'd listened to all this music and then and then he played me King Crimson and I thought wow this is coming from a different place yeah. to all of this and so uh, I hit nerves straight away yeah absolutely I was fascinating and I went out and bought an album uh, which was their second album and it was just something about it was mysterious and intriguing I didn't quite understand the words and uh, but they seemed to you know it wasn't the normal song lyric yeah. it was something other than that and, and deeper than that and the way that it all looked, you know, this beautiful artwork on the sleeve and these mysterious sounding guys. And so I was, yeah, I was really taken with it. And then a year later, I was about 13, I think, I went to see them live. And it was... So from a very early age. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I did kind of, I did walk away thinking this has somehow changed my life. Um, an opinion that in the 80s, when I'd become a kind of cynical, hard-bitten <laughs> professional, I looked back on... Uh, with a degree of cynicism and I thought that's a rather over romanticized thing for a teenager to have thought however I ended up in the band so maybe not you know it's amazing yeah in terms of other influences on your of course guitar work and vocal work what other bands and musicians at that time had an effect on you well, to that extent maybe not to the same extent yeah well the s singing wise I mean you know I, I think if, if if this works and hopefully it does um it's because, you know, the singers in Crimson were what were informing me as a nascent singer anyway, you know. So I'm singing as myself, but because that was what I was listening to, um, I was always rather drawn to singers that sang in an English accent. Uh, and that goes back to even the likes of Anthony Newley or Matt Monroe. Uh, because that was an unusual thing. And uh, I could never understand why, you know, this guy comes from comes from Camden, why is he singing in an American accent? So I was always drawn to that, which meant I also loved uh, the singing of Robert Wyatt and uh, Richard Sinclair, who sang with Caravan and Happy in the North, so I was taken with that. And in terms of uh, musicians, I don't know, um, guitarists, I was a big fan of Alan Holdsworth, who I thought was a brilliant, brilliant musician. And who, I, I mean, I only sought out, because I remember Robert mentioning him in an interview. So, so that's how you... Did you get in touch with him, or did you, you just follow him? Alan Holdsworth. There? Alan Holdsworth. Yeah. Yeah, I did get in touch with him. Um, I, I saw him play, and um, i just left school, and I was working in a record shop, and an album with Alan on came in, and it was on Virgin Records. And I phoned up the record company and put on my best Yorkshire accent and <laughs> pretended to be an old friend of his. Really? And lo and behold, they gave me his phone number. Can you believe that? Goodness me. So I phoned him up and said, do you give lessons? And he said, no. He said, but uh, much to my utter amazement, he said, no, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> he said, uh, but you can come around if you like. Wow. So I used to go to Alan Holdsworth's flat. Just... Uh, and he was brilliant. He showed me, he was really hands-on was Alan. He was interested in sound. And so he would show me amps and he would show me, he'd talk about compression and details. And he wasn't afraid of getting a soldering iron out and... <laughs> and and you know modding his own equipment so I learned a lot about that and I saw him play close up it's frightening technique absolutely extraordinary that's brilliant yeah um, in terms of the album all days again um, mm. so I understand the shows are going to be about three hours but they're a bit they're going to be slightly different every night well w what we've done is since the band this version of the band formed in 2013 we've amassed we keep adding to the repertoire so we have traditionally as we are doing this year toured in two chunks kind of a summery bit and an autumny bit and um, in each set of rehearsals we add two to three numbers either a new number or something from the catalog yeah and we now have we're we're somewhere in the region of 50 songs we have at our repertoire and uh, you know if you know the music you'll know that it's some of it's quite difficult to play yeah um, and what happens is every day at about lunchtime, Robert sends us the set list for that evening. So you don't find out to the lunchtime? No. And sometimes there's a bit of a panic where you think, oh shit, we haven't played that in about, <laughs> in about a month. And uh, you have to do some woodshedding before sound check. You know? yeah. So yes, so yes, for the three nights at the Albert Hall, I guarantee it, it will be a different set every night. And so for the, in terms of the new numbers, what yeah. can fans expect? Well, too much no, well, there's um, there's about forty five minutes worth of. Do you mean uh, brand new material or, yeah, or brand new numbers we've added? Uh, no, or even numbers you've added. Well, yeah. 
I don't really want to give away what no. uh, what we've added because we've added a couple of classic uh, crimson pieces. But um, and the new material is that you know there are some songs I've co-written with Robert, and there's some instrumental stuff that Robert's written um, himself. I'm more fans to be able to hear that. That will be definitely the Albert Hall. Uh, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. I don't know what numbers, no, but no. some of those will definitely appear at the Albert Hall. Yeah. Um, oh, Jacka, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck on the on the tour. It's and, a pleasure. Um, thank look you. Look forward to going to the Albert Hall day. Brilliant.